Okay, uh, welcome back. <clears throat> Let's resume uh, from where we left, at uh, the bottom of page uh, 27 in your PDFs. Um, as his people, his children, we are called to uh, holiness. Okay, so let's uh, understand what it means to be holy just a little bit more deeper, okay? With some of the scriptures that is mentioned. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Uh, First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Okay, Be holy, for I am holy. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, before time began. And so there is a calling, an invitation to partake in his holiness. Uh, it, um, it's up to us to respond to that call. Right? Um, Jesus called the disciples, but it, disciples have to say yes to follow him. Yes or no? And similarly, you know, in all these scriptures that we read, we see that it says God called. He has called. He has called. He has called. The question is, are you going to respond to that call? Okay. And so to call a call to be like him and share his nature is what a, a journey on this holiness is. To partake of his nature, to have his nature reproduced in us and revealed through us. A call to belong completely to Him. The call to holiness is a call to belong fully, wholly and completely to God. Set apart for Him as His people, as His special treasure. Okay, so that's what His holiness is, is that we completely belong to Him. It's not a certain set of do's and don'ts. Right? It's... You are holy, we become holy by you choosing that I want to be like him. I want to become more like him. And I want to behold Jesus. I want to walk like Jesus did. I want to talk like Jesus did. Um, I, when another unbeliever or whoever sees around me, looks at me, I want that person to look at me and say, okay, this person walks and talks like Jesus. You get what I'm saying, right? So Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Israel, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. In this very famous scripture, First Peter chapter two, verse nine and ten. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the call to holiness is to belong completely to him. Um, not 50%, uh, not 99%, um, uh, uh, that we completely belong to him. Uh, because he is jealous about us. Um, he's, and that is translated as um, his love for us. Right? He does not want to share you with any other. Right? Um, so the commandment that what he gave the people of Israel saying that thou shalt have no other God beside me is that the truth is that Isaiah 44 and Isaiah chapter 45 it says that there is no other God I am here of Israel the Lord your God is one it says in Deuteronomy yes or no um, 
but the, why he's saying that is I don't want you to worship any other idols because uh, you are set apart for me and your worship must be set apart for me. I'm jealous about you. I'm zealous about you as a people, as an individual. Are you with me? Right? And so uh, that's why uh, idolatry is, is not accepted by the Lord. What does idolatry stand for? Idolatry in the spiritual is what adultery is in the natural. Okay? Idolatry in the spiritual is what? Adultery is in the natural. Adultery uh, defines what? In the natural is that you are not being faithful to a person that you are called to be faithful for. Yes or no? Right? In, in, in the act of marriage, uh, if uh, if I commit in uh, infidelity, that means I've committed adultery against my wife, isn't it? And so adultery in the natural is what idolatry in the spiritual is. And so that means when I worship other gods or, you know, Id idolatry looks very differently nowadays in the modern era, right? Uh, it's simply saying that my faithfulness does not belong to God. The one who's called me, he who saved me, uh, I realize that I am choosing not to be faithful to the one who saved me. Are you with me? So a, a choice to be holy or to live a holy life, it begins with you simply saying, I belong to you. My 100% belong to you. And that has a lot of depth. That statement has a lot of depth because in everything you do, everything you do, uh, it should look like, okay, how, what would Jesus do, right? How would he live? Because he's the one who's called you and he set the standard pretty high, isn't it? Um, okay. <clears throat> so we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, his own uh, special people. Let's move on. So what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be holy? Simple guys, what, what we've just responded all this while is that a, a responding a call to holiness is us simply saying yes, to be like him and to belong to him. In other words, absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. Right? Um, Jesus, when he lived on the earth, he lived his life in absolute surrender. Uh, in the Gospel of John is a testament for that, that time after time after time, you see that Jesus... Okay, the Son of God, the Word who was with God in the beginning, he time and time again says, my teachings are not my own. What I say to you are not my words. What I do are not my things, things that, I want, that I want to do. Everything that I say is what my Father tells me to say. Everything I do is what my Father tells me to do. Everything I teach is what my Father tells me to teach. We are talking about the Son of God, co-equal with God. The one who has always existed. I want you to understand something, right? Jesus, the Son of the living God. In Hebrews, we see that he is the expression of God's glory. He lived his life in absolute surrender. Uh, how much more should be? And that's what a call to holiness simply is, is living a life of absolute surrender. Are you with me? Right? Uh, and, uh, and practically, this is something that I have learned in the recent years, is that it is a posture of absolute surrender that will keep your life from getting boring, getting bored or mundane. You know, feeling very 
like okay it's monday again i have to go teach these people every day week after week month after month what happens is that i mean it's possible you get into that attitude right uh, of hey i'm leading worship sunday after sunday after sunday after sunday after sunday after sunday i'm leading worship i'm leading worship i'm leading worship i have to come to bible college teach do this how many more years lord that kind of will creep and destroy if i forget and not live by absolute surrender absolute surrender will keep your heart in check will keep reminding you why are you doing what you're doing and who are you doing it for and that's the that simply is the answer to uh, living a life of holiness i hope i'm making sense okay uh, one of my favorite stories of absolute surrender is the life of mary um the mother of jesus um there are hundreds of prophecies about jesus in the old testament right there are hundreds of prophecies god's plan for redemption is his ultimate plan for mankind yes or no god's plan redemption plan is his ultimate plan b plan there's no plan b it's it's the plan it's the only plan right uh, and prophecies after prophecies after prophecies in the old testament that's pointing to the messiah and all of those hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecies had to wait until mary said yes be it unto me according to your will when she said that what happened holy spirit came over her and who did she host jesus right and so when you say absolute yes holy spirit comes over you and you host him and when you host the one who is holy you become holy you become that holy sanctuary don't you know that you are the temple of the living god you are holy it's set apart isn't it right so in this chapter um as we continue we will consider what god has done for us to empower us to walk in holiness okay so he's not just giving us all these verses and said okay i have called you to be holy and uh, you know it's and he's not left us uh, to figure it out by ourselves he's saying okay hey i'm also going to teach you and show you what has been done so that you can live like this okay so first thing what we see is we recognize that the power of sin has been broken and we recognize that we have become new creation in Christ and that as new creation we have been sanctified in Christ okay two very important points that we recognize that the power of sin has been broken okay so on the cross Jesus not only paid for our sins by bearing the punishment for us but he also broke the power of sin over our lives Right, he just didn't pay for our sins while we were yet sinners that he died for us yes but he broke the power of sin so romans chapter 6 verse 6 romans chapter 6 romans chapter 6 by the way is a very important chapter <laughs> knowing this that our old man okay in brackets you will see the old sinful nature so when you see the words old man new man it's simply referring to the sinful nature okay when it's old man it's and when you're saying new man it's new you are a new creation okay so knowing this that our old man that our old sinful nature was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin okay so this truth is enough for us to understand that okay holiness doesn't depend on you right the foundation of it is for you have to realize that the power of sin has been broken over over our lives and you know you are no longer slaves of sin yes or no 
Okay. So Romans chapter 6, verse 11 to 14. Uh, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you shall that you should obey in it, uh, obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Okay, so things get interesting now. It says, present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and you and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Uh, in the next scripture again, at the end of Romans chapter 6, verse 19, it says, So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So, uh, when there are two things, right? We've, we're looking at that the power of sin is broken. That means you and I are no longer slaves to sin okay all of this your journey our journey to salvation uh, to new creation it begins at the cross it begins at the cross right when you encounter jesus in his love and when the moment you give your life to jesus said lord i'm a sinner uh, i repent of my sins come and be my savior i give you my life I confess that you are my Lord and my Savior and that you died on the cross for my sin. Right? And at that moment, what's happening? You're being made a new creation. Holy Spirit is in you. It begins to dwell inside of you. Are you with me? And so at that moment, two things happen. One is we are saved from the state of sin. This is called as a positional truth. Okay, positional truth. So what is positional truth? It simply means that the moment I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I am saved from the state of sin. Are you with me? You are a new creation. The power of sin has, no, has been broken. It has no power over us. You are no longer a slave to sin. Right? You were crucified with Jesus, as it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Are you with me? So that means, so positional truth says that you are saved from the state of sin. However, because we continue to exist in this physical body, we have the capacity to commit the acts of sin. Are you with me? And so that's where the process of sanctification is carried out. So and that's what we're going to learn a little bit. Okay, so new creation is holy, which is sanctified. Okay, I'm just going to read that passage there. A very important truth for us to understand is that as new creation in Christ, we are already sanctified. Okay, that's very important, guys. As new creation in Christ, we are already sanctified. This is positional truth. That means I am saved from the state of sin. That means I am no longer separated from his spirit. What was lost in the garden? When sin came, what happened? Separation. That's basically what sin does. It separated us from the spirit of God. Right? When we say, okay, John chapter 3, verse 16, whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Eternal life, right? So eternal life is not longevity of your existence. Because once I die physically here, I'm going to continue to exist, either in hell or in heaven. So eternal life is not talking about the longevity of your existence. It is simply saying your eternal life is your spirit being reunited with the spirit of God. Yeah. Okay, so that's what's happening here is that when we become a new creation, we are already sanctified. This is the positional truth. Yeah? Okay, God completes the work in the spiritual realm and then invites us to live out that live uh, live out of that in our daily practical lives. Okay? So the work begins it is done in the spiritual realm. Right? The moment Sri Radha gave her life to God whatever day or whatever time which was okay there's an activation that was done in the spiritual realm she is sanctified 
That's the positional truth. She has been saved from the state of sin. Right? And but she's still continuing to exist in that body here on earth. So the sanctification is the process of living that life out on this realm. Okay. You guys are alive, no? <laughs> you are still alive, no? Okay. All right, let's look at a few scriptures. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. That means what? Old, your old man or old sinful nature, right? It's been passed away. It's done. Done and dusted. Gone. Okay? Behold, all things have become new. All things. It doesn't say few things. It doesn't say one of many. All things have become new. Okay. So in just a few verses uh, above, we saw that when he sanctifies us, he sanctifies us wholly, fully, right? Spirit, soul, and body so that's what it means here is second corinthians 5 17 uh, ephesians 4 24 and that you put on new man in other words new creation which was created according to god in true righteousness and holiness now i hope you remember uh if you've done this course on uh who I am in Christ, identity, right? And all of this is already addressed in uh, in the in that course. We're just kind of de-emphasizing it over here. So the new man, the born again person, the new creation we have become on the inside in our spirit is created in God's image and is filled with righteousness and holiness. This new creation is already sanctified and set apart as holy unto God. Okay, the new creation that you've been made has been sanctified and or set apart as holy unto God. And so the completed work of sanctific sanctification, which was which happens when you you know accept the Lord save in Jesus Christ, the completed work, which is the positional truth, and then it becomes a process because we continue to exist in this realm right and that is what is called as the process of sanctification okay everybody say sanctification okay so that, be that becomes called as the process of sanctification okay hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 and 14 Uh, uh, just look at the passage uh, which is uh, in your notes in page 31 in your PDFs. Sanctification, the process of holiness. It says, while there is the positional truth of us being already sanctified in Christ, there is the practical aspect of sanctification, where each day we set ourselves as holy unto the Lord. Each day. That means every day. Right? We have to die to ourselves every day. Take up, take up the cross every day. Right? Um, this is the process of sanctification, where we live out our lives as a people who are sanctified. So what is the process of sanctification? This is very important. It's not just information. This is also a very deep, uh, important uh, doctrinal um, truth. A theological statement. Okay, Because sanctification is a huge topic in the world of theology and doctrine. So what do you mean by sanctification? Right? There are two aspects to it. One is the positional truth. That means you are sanctified by the finished work of the cross when you say yes. And then there is a sanctification process which is shown in the everyday life that you live. Absolute surrender, coming back to that. Okay. Hebrews 10, 10, 14. Uh, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay, we have been sanctified <clears throat> by the body of 
Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So in just those two verses, there's like a past tense and a present continuous. Okay, verse 10, it says, have been sanctified. That means done. And then towards the end, it says, who are being sanctified. Like present and continuous. So it is his sacrifice, what he has done for us on the cross. And us saying yes to that is the process of being sanctified and causes us to be holy. Okay, so some of the practical areas and God's holiness uh, touching these areas of our lives. Uh, let's look at that. So how is this process, the sanctification process, worked uh, out through our lives, in everyday life? Number one, sanctification of our mind and body. Okay, these are just some of the practical areas, guys, and how uh, we live out our daily lives. Sanctification of our mind and body body. We're going to read a couple of scriptures and then we'll discuss about that. <clears throat> so we move from thinking ungodly, unholy thoughts to thinking things that are pure. Okay. Fine, um, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there are any uh, thing praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Okay, so what is this referring to is in your old nature, you could have had all sinful thoughts, all thoughts that are not lovely, thoughts that are not pure, uh, thoughts that are not noble, thoughts that are not true, thoughts that are sinful, thoughts that are not praiseworthy. In your old sinful nature, you could have had all of that. But now that you have made being made into a new creation, now that you are a new creation, you have to start thinking differently. Like a re with a renewed mind. Are you with me? Okay, so the sanctification of our thoughts, words, and deeds also. So it's not just talking about our thoughts, it's also talking about what we do and what we say. So, um, before you were saved, you could have uh, had a lot of wonderful words coming out of your mouth. Flowers. Right? You know what I'm talking about, no? Okay. Oh. Pin. <laughs> <laughs> right you you would have lived a certain way what you did you for example like you could have been an alcoholic or a drug addict right um, and time and time again we see that uh, you know when sinners came to jesus what did he say he addressed them he would touch them he, he would even heal them but then he would say go and sin no more in other words he is saying that you have become a new creation the way you live your life should be different from your old sinful nature. Are you with me? Okay. So, what? How you speak? What you speak? Uh, everything becomes, uh, you know, different, and that, and that shows that you are in the sanctification process. Okay. Sure, there will be times where you will just lose your control or whatever, uh, and hurt people and say things that you shouldn't have, shouldn't have said, whatnot. Uh, but then again, how you respond to that is very important, right? There can be, you can respond two ways. And I have seen this happen all the time among young people. Uh, and I've done this myself, is what happens is uh, we want to live a righteous life, right? We want to please God in the way we live, in the way we speak, and in the way we do things. Um, but life happens, you, you, may, you may fail. Right, uh, you may end up doing things that you don't want to do, and then you will go on a guilt trip. 
uh, I'm a sinner, 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 I'm useless, I'm worthless, blah, blah, blah. You look yourself in the mirror and say, oh, what, what's wrong with you? Talk to yourself, all of that, right? And then what that will do is you will start deciding, okay, I'm not going to go to youth meetings. I'm going to take a break from serving God in the church. So what is happening is you are distancing yourself from God, isn't it? And here's the thing. So what young people also think, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I don't, I haven't interacted much with the elderly. And so I don't really know how much, how they think, but they say, okay, I messed up. I'm going to take a break <laughs> away from the only person who can heal you and expect to get healed. You yeah, understood? Okay, I messed up. So I'm going to be away from God to get better and then come back to God. But when the only person who can heal you and, and, and change you is God. Are you with me? Right? Uh, so, you know, and that's, sanctification is a process. As much as we've been saved, uh, you saying yes to the process shows where you are standing in the positional truth. Yeah? Yes or no? Okay. <laughs> so, first uh, expression is sanctification of a mind and body. How you think, what you say, what you do. Uh, and then, second is the sanctification of our desires, our affection, our passion. So we bring to God our bodily desires and appetites and seek to be holy in these. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to 8 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So, Again, verse 8 ends by saying, starts off by saying, therefore. Why is it therefore? Okay. okay. He who rejects this does not reject man, but God. So he's talking about, if I reject to live a life of holiness, okay, and then just continue to live like uh, Gentiles, as it mentioned, uh, who live a life like, who do not know God, with committing sexual immorality, giving my body to be possessed with lust uh, and whatnot without honor and sanctification, I'm rejecting God. And so, so in the sanctification process, the way we live off our life is also expressed in our desires. What do you desire? What is your desire? Right? Uh, who receives your affection? What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about the things of God or, or are, you or are your passions changed? Right. Um, again, so your old man or your old sinful nature is died. You are no longer slaves to sin. Are you with me? Okay. But that doesn't mean you will not be tempted. Now, temptation again gives way. Because due to what what you desire, for example, let's say um, um, okay, think of an example fast. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say I was addicted to pornography, but I was not uh, addicted to alcohol. Okay, are you with me? Uh, let's say I was addicted to pornography, but I was not addicted to alcohol. Now, someone can't come to me with alcohol and say, you know, like, hey, look at this beautiful bottle. 
you know so and i will not have it is not temptation to me because i have never had an appetite for alcohol and so i can't be tempted by it i have not had any desire for that right but in the past i have had desires for pornography right i've had the appetite for it so if if someone were to come and tempt me with that it is a possibility that i can fall for it is it isn't it yeah and so but do those desires change what happens when you become a new creation is that you are no longer just fighting for that desires it's like okay holy 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 it's you come to a place in god so deep that things of the world doesn't even bother or affect you i mean that means if by the time i reach uh, leave bangalore bible college and home the number of billboards that are there with all wonderful designs on it <laughs> uh you know i should be a mess yes sir and you know that's the beauty of it is you are in a such a deep place with god uh, that his beauty is what matters to you and nothing else matters and so your desires your affection uh, your love is being overwhelmed by his beauty and his affection and his and his, his affection for you and how much he loves you and nothing else matters everything else like that hymn says turn your eyes upon jesus look forth on his wonderful face let the things of the world let the things of the world become fairly dim in the light of your wonderful face and so when his, when the light of his face is shining and which is the most brightest before you it's like nothing else matters everything else is dim what else are you going to see what else is going to take your attention away right in uh, i think proverbs chapter 16 verse 15 says in the light of the king's face is life i hope it's right okay but yes in the light of the king's face is life and that reminds me of number 6 how numbers chapter 6 ends with aaronic blessing may the lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you why because when his countenance increases it affects us isn't it moses's face was radiating because he was in the very presence of god yes um in psalm 34 says those who looked on him and their faces were radiant and so the light of his face dims everything else of the earth and that affects our desires and our affection and that helps us live out this uh, or go through this process of sanctification okay okay 4 uh, and 5 sanctification of our time talents and money we desire to glorify god with our time by ensuring we do not waste time and put it to good use we seek to use our skills and capabilities in meaningful ways to glorify god and bless people we honor god with our money by giving generously into the work of his kingdom and to help other people who are in need so you see how sanctification affects all of this like in our day to day lives everything changes and finally sanctification of our family home and possessions in our marriage in our family life how we nurture our children our home and earthly possessions we seek to be set apart unto god and glorify god okay um so with this we end this chapter in the next chapter we'll go a little bit more deeper in on the same subject uh, of uh, sanctification okay so what we want to reemphasize about this chapter from the previous chapter is that now that we've understood how holy he is uh, how wonderful and how magnificent our god is um he wants to share that nature with us and he wants to he wants us to reveal that nature through us as well okay um so with that we'll uh, pause for today um and we'll resume next week
All right, any thoughts or questions, guys? Right, I hope uh, there was something that you could learn from today's class. Um, and um, please meditate on it when you can. And God bless you. Thanks for joining. Take care. Have a good one. Hello, Sam, Mr. Samuel.